given high priority for government COVID contracts, official report fines. And again, this is indicative of what open democracy are doing. They're talking about this, um, but they were talking about it when people weren't. And we'll get into that. Anyways, companies with political connections were directed to a high priority channel for UK government contracts, where bids were 10 times more likely to be successful, according to a damning report by the National Audit Office, right? So they're 10 times more likely down this high priority channel. Around 10% of the suppliers referred to the channel by a political contact were awarded a PPE contract, the NAO reported. Suppliers without such links, by contrast, only had a 1% chance of winning a contract. More than £10 billion pounds worth of contracts were awarded without competition during this period, the spending watchdog found, with a special channel set up that allowed almost 500 suppliers with links to politicians or senior officials to pitch directly for work. <laughs> Since the pandemic began, Open Democracy has reported on numerous COVID contracts being awarded without comp uh, competition or with terms being kept secret or other met met uh, measures which bypass normal transparency requirements. Labour MP Dawn Butler, a member of the House of Commons Science and Technology Select Committee, labelled the absence of oversight in the procurement process a national scandal. Uh, before we move on to Dawn Butler's comments, I just want to bring up this one graphic as well that George Mumbia put up today. It's a little tweet where he mentions that the BBC is now saying that they broke this story and taking credit for the fantastic hard work done by Byline Times, Open Democracy, reported on by the Canary, by the way, and some journalists at The Guardian um, uh, and other outlets as well, a, few, a couple of other independent outlets. But really, I think the key drivers on this have been Open Democracy and Byline Times that we had last week. Uh, so I want to bring in Adam here and ask him a few questions about this, seeing as he's uh, open democracy and himself have been following this from the beginning. Now, first off, I'm just going to get a dig in at Labour because this is what, uh, uh, you know, Andrew Neil or someone like that would would do. And I'm going to channel him for a moment. Dawn Butler called it a national disgrace, a national scandal, uh, that there's no oversight or the absence of oversight in the procurement process, which is the way that we get stuff. The way that government gets stuff, there was no one overlooking that. That's what it is in plain English. But Labour have been equally bad on privatisation and procurement, haven't they, in their history? When they were in government, they were pretty bad. Um, well, it, it's just opportunism. Well, look, we, we need to understand that this is kind of, you know, the current playing out of the process that, yeah, absolutely began when Labour started privatising the NHS. And, you know, um, they, they introduced internal markets and, and there were a whole series of scandals back then. And that's got, as people predicted, it would at the time bigger and bigger and bigger but it is a new scale it is bigger again because you know services which in many cases i think shouldn't be privatized in the first place by the way you know are given not just to private companies but to basically the mates of people in power which is what this report is ultimately saying um is is a whole new level of sort of what we can only call cronyism um at the heart of our response to this pandemic and i think the thing that is really important to understand is that you know the uk is going into a second lockdown because of the failure of the test and trace system so when the test and trace system which was you know privatized to these companies which turn out to basically be the mates of people in power and those companies failed to deliver it sufficiently to stop us from going into a second lockdown you know that 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 corruption that cronyism is the reason that more people are dying from COVID, and also is the reason that we're going into a second lockdown. Yeah, but, well, isn't that just the government relying on people that they could trust in a health emergency? I mean, isn't that an understandable and acceptable course of action? This, it, this is what people do. They reach out to people that they know and say, hey, can you help us out here? We're in a, in a crisis. Well, I think firstly, the you know the pretty good evidence, given how badly Britain has done compared to other countries in this pandemic, is that they couldn't trust them. Um, you know, why should we be trusting you know, major global corporations whose only duty is to profit for their shareholders? Why you know why aren't they, for example, investing all this extra money into the NHS, into local government, into public services that you know do exist and are accountable to the people, do exist in order to you know 
to make our lives better. Why are they chucking all this cash at essentially their rich mates? Hmm. Well, as I mentioned before, now this story is pretty common knowledge. Um, you know, it's on uh, WhatsApp. People mention it on WhatsApp groups across the country and it gets used on Gogglebox. And, you know, people will refer to it as common parlance. Oh, yeah, we just know that the Conservatives dosh out, dole out cash to their mates uh, on failed cock-ups, basically. But it wasn't to begin with, was it? How did open democracy get into this? And and how hard was it to get the establishment media to take this story and run with it? Well, I think, I think the first thing is to say is that massive credit goes to a couple of my colleagues. My colleague Caroline Malloy has been investigating privatisation of the NHS since about 2012 and breaking lots of extraordinary stories in that space. So this is, you know, in, in journalism terms, this is about long-term development of the beat. Um, my colleague Peter Gagan, who's our investigations editor, has also been turning out lots of great stories about this. And so, you know, so part of it's that. Part of it is, you know, we've talked in the pandemic as it started about, you know, what is it that we should be investigating? And if, if you're in journalism, you should be asking yourself the question, you know, what's the power that we're seeking to interrogate? And one of the questions we asked ourselves is, well, who's going to profiteer from the back of this crisis? Because there's always someone in any given crisis, you know, sat there looking at the disaster and rubbing their hands together thinking, well, you know, this is this is going to make me some money. And so, you know, we saw it as our job to ask ourselves that question and look into it. And, it, you know, it turned out not to be hard. Um, it turned out that, there, you know, the UK government, perhaps to no one's surprise, really was behaving quite badly and, and is doling out contracts to um you know to friendly companies to people they know and so so i suppose you know for me it starts off with a caroline's long-term work but b also asking that question which you should always ask as a journalist which is what is the power that we're going to hold to account in this in this situation and and did did this take a while before the subject media yeah so so i think i think the thing that's fascinating in, in a sense you know, the reason I chose this story, which is um, much more recent than a lot of this work we've been doing, is that this was the point that a lot of the kind of traditional media picked up on it. And I find that fascinating because what that means is, you know, the National Audit Office is a kind of institution of government. And people whose job it is meant to be to hold power to account were only willing to really do that job in many cases once a powerful body told them it was okay. So once they got permission from the National Audit Office to say, oh, yeah, this is a bad thing, then they're able to report on the fact that it's a bad thing. But the fact that the thing had happened, you know, we had all the documents. It's not like anyone contested that this was going on. And the fact that it happened wasn't sufficient. They had to wait until those in power, a group of them, the National Audit Office, said, oh, yeah, no, it is OK for you to, for you to kick those other people in power. Um, but they weren't going to, you know, just go and do the jobs themselves too often. Yeah, that's a pretty damning indictment of the media, isn't it? And it's what we talk, uh, we often talk about in our circles about um, the over reliance on official sources and you yeah, know absolutely. have inherent self interest often in maintaining those in power and keeping them in power. So they're not always the best sources, and also it means you're not doing journalism. Now, par partially that might be due to budgetary constraints, but. Hello, uh, Hazel, I want to uh, bring this to, uh, to another question, which is, what, what do you think this story tells us about the state of British politics, um, particularly how the government and the state deals with crises and, and providing for its citizens? Is this something unique? Or as Adam says, you know, this is the question you should always ask yourself. There's always going to be someone profiting from a crisis. I mean, isn't that a sad state of affairs? Yes, but it wouldn't be the first time we'd seen it. I mean, I think the point with a crisis is it allows you to take shortcuts and to do things um, without people really noticing and to do things quickly, except luckily for us, uh, open democracy has been, you know, had its eye on dark money and before this and following the money now and is able to um, pull them up. But I think some of the things I've found so shocking is how ill prepared some of these companies were that they've um, dished out large amounts of money to do things uh, that they'd never done before. I don't know if that's something you'd like to uh, elaborate on, uh, Adam, but I found that, you know, it's almost comical. I mean, I find it, like you talk about cronyism, it, it sort of defies belief. 
that a company that had never ever done the thing that they're asking them to do before would be awarded contracts on these terms so I think it's like it's completely shocking and not the least bit surprising and it's the sort of thing people try and get away with um, in situations like these so you know hats off to open democracy really for getting it out there yeah did that surprise you though actually adam that um i mean we see cronyism uh we maybe even expect it now in a crisis did you expect the cronyism to be this flawed this you know fallible like i mean it just they just didn't come close to being able to do anything right as far as any you know as i say to the point often this kind of corruption which is often a feature of the system rather than something different can go unnoticed because usually a good deal of the services and so forth that we need are still being provided sort of you know enough people are okay but this seems to be widely just a massive fail i think that you know one of the ways to understand the sort of developing political situation over the last generation or so in the uk is not that the corruption is increased it's not that the sort of extent to which the ruling class looks after the rest of the ruling class has grown it's that they've got worse and worse of it and so it's become more and more visible. So, you know, we see this with the, you know, up until 2008, it's true that the very rich are enriching themselves, but they're clever enough at least to, you know, lend everyone money so that we keep buying stuff from them so that they can make more money back. And then the financial crisis happens because they hadn't really understood that they were doing that. They hadn't understood that, you know, that was the way the economy was working. And they've tried to reinflate that level since, but people have kind of seen through that. You know, we see that, Similarly with, you know, whether you go back to the phone hacking scandal, it's not like that stuff wasn't happening before. It's just that, you know, they were incompetent enough to get caught. You know, and, and I think the way I see this is, in a sense, part of a long history, which goes all the way back to empire, where, you know, the British ruling class, you know, they, they went around conquering the world and killing people in order to steal their stuff. But that at least it gave them enough resource to be kind of good, as being evil, good at being evil rulers. You know, they were kind of successful in that task. Whereas what's happened since is they've kind of decayed quite a lot to the point that they're also quite incompetent. 